On today's show, the Bucks prepare to hit the road with a back-to-back -back in Utah and Denver. It could be challenging. We're going to break down the injury report for this Utah game and then look ahead to the Nuggets, which brings us to this MVP debate, which, let's face it, it's got a little bit nasty, so we are going to discuss that. And then I've got a big question for Justin Garcia, who joins me tonight, about which of the teams in the East is keeping him up at night. Who does Justin fear? We're going to break down the NBA standings, particularly the Eastern Conference. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Bucks, your daily Milwaukee Bucks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are locked on Bucks. My name's Kane Pittman. You can see and hear me on this show Monday to Friday and also find my work over at ESPN. Joining me from the Bucks Radio Network, our good friend, Justin Garcia, and he's preparing to have some late nights over the weekend because the Bucks are heading west, uh, as I said, to take on the Jazz and the Nuggets. As always, we thank you for making Locked On Bucks your first watch or first listen of every single weekday and sometimes on the weekend, including this weekend. We will have a post-game show after the Denver game, so make sure you subscribe and turn the notifications on. Hit a like, drop a comment, give us a review if you're listening on the audio platform because it's free to do it, and uh, we really appreciate it because it actually truly does help us and boost the show up in the in the pecking order and all those types of things. So we appreciate it. I mentioned the other day we're trying to get to 7K subs before the postseason. Now, I might be pushing my luck, but I think our listeners can get the job done. We're up to 6.33K. So we're looking for a bit more of a boost to get us to 7K before the postseason. And then we know, it, not, the, not the regulars, we'll have some bandwagoners jumping on in the postseason, Justin, because we think the Bucks are going to go on a run and we're going to break it down on this show Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, an official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on today to get started. Justin, the Jazz on Friday night, the Nuggets on Saturday night. Let me just read you the injury report here for this Utah game because we've discussed what are the Bucs going to do? How are they going to approach this? We think they were always going to go their best or give their best in the front end of the back-to-back, -back, and then we'll see what they do health-wise on the back, both games at altitude. The Utah Jazz, the injury report, out. Jordan Clarkson, Rudy Gay, Colin Sexton, and then the big one, Lowry Markinen also not going to play in this game. And the Bucks are pretty much as they have been recently. No Jay Crowder, still no Goran Dragic. Maybe we can talk about that. No Myers Leonard. But the Jazz, what's going on? This all of a sudden present, presents itself for the Bucks as... Hey, you better go get this one. Um, what uh, what was the timeline for Will Hardy taking the job in Utah? Like uh, this was it was before um, Ime Udoka had to had, had his suspension with the yes. Celtics, wasn't it? Because uh, that's the only thing I could think of of uh, maybe it's Will Hardy just taking it out on the Celtics for not giving him the job instead of Joe Missoula if he was still there. But uh, yeah, very surprising. To uh, to see that injury report for the Utah Jazz, however, um, I was I, I was kind of curious about this game going in because Utah has been on a bit of a slide recently. Uh, it's still head and shoulders above where most of us thought they'd be this season, but they finally slid out of the top ten. And you know, if you're the Jazz, you're 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 not going to catch the Trailblazers in all likelihood, so you're going to finish at best in this scenario with the fourth worst record in the West, but it is probably more their goal or more aligns with their goal and, and what they're trying to do here to not make the playoffs. So uh, in that regard, this injury report, isn't that surprising? Yeah, it's an interesting take going back to the start of the season. I, I thought the jazz would have the worst record in the NBA. Now, part right. of that was because I thought that they would trade out anyone that had any value we just watched Eurobasket, but I still even didn't expect this Lowry Markinen that we've seen all season long. So there's been reasons why they've been competitive. And for the most part, they've been fun to watch. And even Walker Kessler, who, by the way, if, if people want to go back to the pre-draft podcast we did, I was like, whatever you do, Bucks, don't draft this guy. You don't need to draft a, a five-man. You've got Brooke Lopez for a few years. So half my take was fine because I backed in Brooke to play great. He's been awesome. But I, I didn't know whether drafting a guy like that, and maybe long-term, we'll see what it means, but Kessler's been absolutely outstanding. So the Jazz have been uh, pretty good. As far as the Bucks go, you're obviously around this team significantly more. Well, actually, I'm not never around this team this season, but maybe soon. We'll see what happens. 
no gore and Dragic, and we're at least getting questions about this. Have you, is he out on court warming up? Is he out practicing? Have you seen anything from gore and Dragic? Because it is kind of bizarre that it's been a couple of weeks now and he's still just not even available to play. Yeah, uh, the only bizarre thing, I suppose, was um, th- that very short window right after the Bucks had signed him where he was um, upgraded and available for a game but didn't actually play. And then all of a sudden it was just he's out again with the knee. And Bud even said it dated back to his time in Chicago and you know he didn't play those final few games with the Bulls. And they had said it was the, the same knee issue that he was dealing with which, you know, on the surface, you'd say, okay, this makes sense if this has kind of been a lingering thing that he's been dealing with. But there was that very, very brief period where he was available and Bud basically told us he's not going to play, but he's going to be on the bench or he'll only play if, you know, things really get out of hand. And I I think that might have been the Warriors game. I can't recall. Um, But that's the only somewhat surprising or, or I guess interesting thing to me with that whole situation. Um, and plus, you know, look, you don't really need Goran Dragic right now. It's just if he's healthy and available for the postseason, it does kind of remind you of how they handled PJ Tucker and the Jay Crowder thing to the same level as well. Um, You're not concerned. Be... Are you concerned about Jay Crowder? I, I'm not from a distance because we know no, this is what the Bucks do. It's what they do. I'm not concerned. Um, for a little bit yet. I, I mean, if you go back to yesterday or Wednesday when they played the Spurs, um, my concern isn't going to start to elevate until we get past these first two games. Right. If there's no updates, because he did say prior, he being Bud prior to the Spurs game, there was a good chance that uh, one or both of those guys would be available early in this road trip. So if, mm-hmm. if we get to Monday when you're in Detroit against the Pistons and they're both, still listed as out and there's been no updates, then you can, then you can say uh, what, what, what's going on here. But until we get there, I'm not concerned yet. Yeah. I mean, I'm ready to cut bait on Dragic and just go ahead and sign Dante Exum, as I've said the whole time. Now I'm only saying this because people will laugh or they'll be shaking their head and they'll be saying, Kane, we are dead set sick of you talking about Dante Exum, but Frank tagged me in something Dante Exum related and Frank gave it the tick of approval. So I know everyone takes it with a grain of salt when I say Exum, but at least a man is playing at a high level over in Europe and he could be that second or third guard off the bench. But anyway, I do hope that Dragic, we at least get a look at him on the road to the postseason. Definitely, obviously, Jay Crowder is more important to this team. But this is the Utah Jazz game. That's 8 p.m. Central time. So as I mentioned off the top, because it's a weekend back-to-back, and there's just such a short turnaround between these two games. We will have a post-game show for the Denver game, uh, but not for the Utah game. So just putting that on the agenda there, which is why we're going to get it into the MVP conversation here in just a little bit. But as we continue to look at the standings, the Bucks still with that three-game gap in the loss column over the Sixers and the Celtics for Milwaukee, obviously 10 games to play. So they're obviously in a pretty good position. The other thing that is fascinating as we look, because we're all watching the Celtics and we're all watching the Philadelphia 76ers. So the Sixers are in San Francisco to play the Warriors on Friday night. Joel Embiid and James Harden, both questionable for that game. And I didn't watch the second game against the Bulls. They blew them out. Uh, But uh, they might be legitimate concerns with those guys. I'm not 100% sure. But if they don't play against the Warriors, if you're the Bucs, you're like, okay, we'll take that. Yeah, I mean, you'll you'll definitely take it. Um, I didn't see it in real time either, with it being the same game as as our yeah. our game, same time as our game against the Spurs. Um, but it has kind of been the norm that uh, I think if you went back to all the game books and looked at uh, Philadelphia's schedule this season, it, it feels like Joel Embiid would be listed as questionable for about seventy percent of those games. He's listed as questionable, but does end up playing. So uh, he did not play in the second half of that game against the Bulls. It was kind of mysterious from everything that I, I observed of uh, those around the Sixers where wasn't a whole lot of messaging, kind of, kind of similar, similar to what we deal with. We and then uh, and then midway through that uh, half, it was just, yeah, Joel's he's, he's dealing with that, so he's not going to play the rest of this game. And they, it, they were blowing the Bulls out by that point. So I would assume Joel Embiid will play in that game against the Warriors just because that's been his M.O., this season, the Harden thing, I mean, I am very curious of that. He has missed some time with that this year. Uh, missed the game against the Bulls as well just a couple of days ago with the same issue. 
in that Achilles. So that is something to monitor, but I expect MB to play uh, as, as I said, because of it's kind of been how the Sixers have handled it with him this year. And I know we'll get into the discussion, but because of that three letter award, and this is one of those hmm. games that Joel Embiid has a chance to, to really shine and separate himself. If he can lead the Sixers past the Warriors on the road, a place where the Warriors don't lose all that often. This is why we continue to talk about the health stuff for all these teams. On the injury report, it says calf tightness for Joel Embiid. And if you're a Philadelphia 76ers fan and you're, you know that he's playing with or trying to play with calf tightness, you're watching and holding your breath because same for the Bucs, but all these teams, something goes wrong at this time of year, it can derail everything for you. But we are going to talk about the MVP next because the Bucs do play Denver on Saturday night. Before we do that, we are going to deliver... Nissan's most electric player of the week, which is, of course, brought to you by the all-new, all-electric 2023 Nissan Aria. And it's going to Giannis this week for that performance against the San Antonio Spurs. And people might say, no, no, no. It means nothing when you do something against the San Antonio team that's not winning. But the thing that I love about it was the electricity, just similar to the Nissan Aria, that Giannis was playing with, trying to score. 23 minutes, 23 shots. That's what you like to see when you're playing these teams that are clearly inferior potentially not trying to win. And when we think of Giannis and the Nissan Aria, we think of something that is brilliantly fierce and fiercely elegant and definitely stunningly powerful. A few dunks from Giannis, a couple of those finished lobs, uh, very, very powerful stuff. And uh, Giannis is a two-way player. And uh, the uh, Nissan Aria delivers on duality as well with a combination of fierceness and elegance. Beautiful but strong. The 2023 Nissan Aria packs Pinty a punch seat power I don't think I said that right. And premium intelligence all in one EV, the all new, all electric 2023 Nissan Aria, the EV for people who love to drive. Shop now at nissanusa.com. All right, this game against Denver, people are going to be talking about it, I'm sure. You know, we make the assumption that Giannis and Jokic both play. We hope they do. And. The MVP stuff has been really weird, and we've briefly touched on it on this show, but we haven't dove in and had a full-blown conversation about it. But given that Giannis is playing Jokic, they're going to play the Sixers in a couple of weeks here, it's not a bad time to get into it. Now, all three guys, one one of them is going to win it. It's down to three guys. We understand that. All three guys are just having insane seasons. But I know from the YouTube comments that Bucks fans are getting a little bit frustrated. They think Giannis is being overlooked. They think he's being disrespected. Do you buy into that at all? And everyone is pitching and making their cases. I would argue the Bucs aren't publicly doing it, which, by the way, I like that. You yeah. don't want to be out there desperately pitching for your guy and asking to win an MVP. That's just sad. Um, so I guess first I'd start with, I don't hope that Nikola Jokic plays because I want the Bucs to have as, as good a chance to win these games and secure the Reasonable. one seed. Um and also that game between, we assume, Embiid and Jokic, it's just a couple of days away. It's in this really, yeah. really big stretch. This is um, really the chance for, for Joel Embiid to separate himself because he has the Warriors on Friday, in Phoenix on Saturday, and, of course, no Kevin Durant. And then the showdown with Nikola Jokic on Monday. Then a couple of days, less than a week later, he's in Milwaukee to take on the Bucks, and then they host the Celtics. So this is it. For Joel Embiid in this stretch here. Um, I don't think Giannis has been overlooked or disrespected at all. Um, it's look, I I know I've I've had this conversation with others on various shows as well. Um, the MVP is a narrative award, and it's you know, we may be once Giannis won his first two and you observed everything that happened afterwards, is is when you kind of got the sense of how this works. And hmm the best narrative out there. And I, I said this a couple of weeks ago, it, it seemed to me pretty clear once Denver started that slide, Joel Embiid is going to win the MVP and barring Giannis just having a monster week here and scoring 50 against the Celtics and doing the same against Embiid and Embiid falling off a little bit. I, I think at this point it's, it's very close to a certainty that Joel Embiid is going to win it because his team is likely going to finish with a better record or very close to it than the top seeded Denver Nuggets. He hasn't won one yet. Nikola Jokic has won two in a row. Giannis won two in a row before that. And that's just kind of how it works. It's similar to the Academy Awards, where it might not always be the most worthy or the best that wins that award, but it's 
oh, this guy hasn't got one yet. Let's make up for it. And it's not to take away from Joel Embiid's season. All three of these guys have been great, but it's largely a narrative award. And the best narrative out there right now is for what Joel Embiid has done. He's been great. And it's basically his turn is how this is viewed, that he's been the runner up two years in a row. He's played just as well, if not better than each of those two years. And his team has had a great deal of success when you weren't sure how things would go. So I don't think it's a matter of Giannis being shortchanged or people aren't taking this into account. This is just how these awards work. I mean, look at how many LeBron James and Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant won. It's not the best player that wins this award all the time. Okay, that's a very level-headed way to look at it. And I I think actually what you said is accurate. And I know for a fact there will be people that will jump in the comments. They'll be fired up about that because it seems like you're saying that Giannis – you know, isn't the guy that is in the front position or pole position. So I know you're not saying that, but but you say that he hasn't been overlooked, but then you also say that you have formed your opinion in your head because you understand how the game works when it comes to MVP. But that's not fair, right? Like in, in a perfect world, that is not fair. Uh, no, but I mean, the other thing is this. Um, we do all of this comparison. And I guess my big pain point with this is I understand the pushback from two years ago when Bucks fans, and I was in that category too, were upset that Giannis was going to be overlooked no matter how good he was because he had won two in a row. We can't give it to a guy three years in a row because you have to be an all time great and you got to win in the postseason. And this is, you know, should be a regular season award. All of that stuff aside, we can't be upset about it. And then if it's finally going to change, and, and I don't think Nikola Jokic is going to win the award, to be clear, but we can't be upset about that a couple of years ago and say, well, this isn't right and this isn't fair. And now if that is corrected and Nikola Jokic was the front runner and was going to win it, to all of a sudden be up in arms and say, well, look, here's how Giannis compares to it. The, the whole comparison thing to me is what's been really off putting is all three of these guys can be individually great and you can make a strong case for each of these three you can I think Giannis has the strongest case that he is clearly the best two-way player in the league so if that's your definition of MVP he's the MVP but that's just not most of the voters definition so uh, to me the the conversation has become just draining with all of the comparisons and, and not just recognizing man what Nikola Jokic is doing is pretty historic and really great. Like we don't need to instantly jump in with, yeah, but Giannis did this. Or if Joel Embiid did this, yeah, but Giannis is doing this in fewer minutes and vice versa. I agree. And I think the the biggest shame for me is what you pointed to. And by the way, Bucks fans don't need to, this is the way that it's gone now. So they don't need to care about, you know, how Philadelphia fans feel or Denver fans feel. They don't. They can go to bat for Giannis however they want and create all their little clips and put their stats up there. I love it. I find it entertaining. I just think more broadly it's a shame that I think Giannis is the MVP and I can make a case for him pretty comfortably and I've got uh, some numbers I want to throw at you here in just a second. So I think Giannis is the MVP. I probably feel like it's going to be closer than maybe it sounds like you think it will be with Embiid and Giannis. Like, I think Giannis is literally right there. Like, I, I think that there, again, has been a shift fairly or unfairly away from Jokic because the noise got so loud that you can't win three in a row. And if Jokic doesn't win it and Embiid does, then Bucks fans should have some level of sympathy for Jokic because th that's why I think Bucks fans are well within their rights to say, hey, why is this changing now? Even if you can say yes, the argument that it should have been fair for Giannis to win a third MVP is totally fine. I think it's also okay to feel aggrieved by the fact that it changed and your guy missed out. I think Giannis is the best uh, player in the league and the best two-way player. So by those definitions, I think he's the MVP as well. Yeah. I don't think he's going to win it, but I do agree with you that I, I think at this point it's down to Giannis and Joel Embiid. And I think Nikola Jokic is the guy that now is in a distant third, unless Denver wins their final nine or 10 games and, and he you know has a triple-double in each of those games and, and continues to post those numbers. But I think the recent struggles that the Nuggets have had, the, the amount of pushback that it, I think there is a backlash to the backlash of Nikola Jokic's <laughs> yeah. advanced stats where it's it's kind of been like, okay, we're, we're, we're putting a little too much into this. And honestly, one of the things that started to hurt was they were undefeated uh, whenever when he had a triple double, I think 28 no, 
And then you had that stretch where Denver started to struggle and he had two or three straight triple doubles where they lost. And then I think people started to say, well, is he stat padding? And that's when that conversation started to come in, which is not at all the case. But I do think uh, Nikola Jokic now with the way his team has played and with a little bit of backlash to him, I think he is in third behind Joel Embiid and Giannis. I would still say at this point, it wouldn't be my vote, but I do think Joel Embiid is a pretty clear front runner. It's not to say Giannis can't pass him, but if you ask me today who is going to win it, I would say it's going to be Joel Embiid. Well, I think if you're asking me for percentages, and you absolutely didn't ask me for percentages, but if you did, 40% Embiid and Giannis, 20% Jokic. Wow, you're 40, 40, 20. Okay. I think so. Yeah. I think it's going to be closer than that. I think that Giannis is going to continue to, even though there's only a couple of weeks left, I think their momentum might continue. I want to give you some numbers around this stuff uh, in just a second. We'll continue the MVP chat. And I've got a listener question from yesterday actually regarding Embiid and the Sixers. So we'll get to that next. All right, so I had to do a quick little, and it's over here in Australia, so you know it won't surprise anyone. But I'm not doing TV with Scotty Van Pelt, that's for sure. But I did a, uh, I do Australian Sports Center, which actually, you know, we've got some, some, you know, some people that uh, I'm sure Bucks fans would recognize that we do it with. It's a cool thing for me to do. This week, they said, we want you to get, make your case for MVP. Now, it's going to be a, no surprise to anyone that I said I think Giannis is the MVP, and I gave a few reasons why. Some of it you already pointed to. The Bucs right now have the best record in the NBA. Historically, that means something. He is, I would say, universally chosen as the best two-way player out of these three guys. Embiid is a terrific defender, but Giannis, I think, is next level. And then the other point that I, I just brought up, and this is something we've seen a little bit of lately, but I think if you're making a case for Giannis, you have to take into account how little Chris Middleton has played this year because that that is just something that is factually changed the way the Bucs played to start this season. There's no question that it impacted the efficiency for Giannis at the start when he was forced to do more than perhaps he would have done in recent years. And the stats are great. And the points per game and the points per minute is career high level. We love it. But the facts are that he's played 318 minutes with Chris Milton this season. 318 and only 23 games. James Harden and Joel Embiid have played 1,349 minutes together. And Nikola Jokic and Jamal Murray have played 1,434. So they've played... 1,000 minutes plus more together with the second best player in the team. And people will say, well, it's an individual award. Okay, but it, that's not the way this works. So uh, to me, I just look at that and I say, you put in what the Bucs have had to go through, not just with Chris Milton, but other players along the way. That's his big biggest case and his best case for me. That's his best. And he has the best of those three, the best record when he plays, best team record when he yes, plays. Yes, yeah, so- great point. So that that to me, look, and like I've said, I I think he's the best player in the league, and I do, I think that that last point too is another thing that has kind of detracted from Nikola Jokic's uh, candidacy because now you're seeing a lot more of, yeah, but Nikola Jokic basically only plays with the starters, and that's how they've juiced his plus minus numbers, which was a thing that everybody pointed to. So uh, this more than more than any year I can remember in the last decade plus, this truly is a case of three very, very deserving candidates. I mean, you'll have your years where it's down to one, like two guys. I mean, you think back to the Giannis Harden debate that we had for a couple of years um, and Giannis versus Jokic too. So um, this is, you know, the first time in a while we have had three guys where you can make a very, very strong case for each of those three. And honestly, one of the bigger surprises is that, you know, for all of Boston's success, and they're still right up there with the Celtics and the Sixers, uh, that Jason Tatum went from being the MVP frontrunner through Hmm. December, basically through right around Christmas Day, just before New Year's, to completely falling off the map in this debate when his team is still right up there and a chance to get the one seat. I mean, my thing with Jason Tatum the whole time was, terrific player, sure. I think there's been far too big a push to push him into those types of categories. I said that last year and I thought he started great this year. But when I sit down to watch the Boston Celtics, I'm not sure who's going to be the best player on the floor. And plenty of times it's been Jalen Brown. So that's the big case against Jason Tatum uh, so far. And as you pointed to, he's kind of dropped off uh, the race there as is Luka Doncic because the Mavericks probably aren't winning enough games there. So it's fascinating. Yeah. And he's missed time. And uh, I agree. Look, I'm not saying, well, Jason Tatum should be in there. That's just the interesting part is this guy was a front runner 
And Jalen Brown has you know, basically outplayed him the last two months of the season. Yeah, absolutely. All right. We've got one listening question here I want to get to before uh, we look ahead to the weekend and these two big games for the Bucks. So I asked uh, our listeners, our viewers on YouTube, not including health, because if you say, what's the biggest concern for the Bucks? Everyone says healthy. I say, oh, yeah, that's a fair point. I agree with you. That's what I'm concerned about when I wake up in the morning and think about the potential of the Bucks title this year. Uh, so not including health. And Karan Kenner said backup center, Backup PG, but th- let's stick with the backup center stuff uh, for right now. Now we know they've signed Myers Leonard, but you know that that matchup with Philadelphia has always loomed and has loomed for the last five six years. There's there's been other years where you got a second Lopez brother, which is pretty handy to have in case you need it in emergency yeah. situations. That that still just looms large for me with a potential Philadelphia series. Are, are you worried about that? Because again, hey, no disrespect on this podcast towards Joel Embiid and Nikola Jokic, but Embiid is an effing monster, and you know that will be causing me some anxiety if we do get the Bucks Sixers series. I mean, I suppose, but um, what team in the league has two centers right. that you can oh. you know throw Joel Embiid? That I, I get that, uh, and it would be yeah. I mean, it, well. <laughs> Yes and no. I mean, they have yeah. two guys, but it's two guys that Joel Embiid has destroyed throughout his career. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I get that concern, but it's A, no team in the league has the the amount of personnel to deal with Joel Embiid in, in waves. And, I mean, when you you look at the minutes here for backup center, it's, the, it's just not going to be a lot. So that's where my concern – kind of goes away and especially in the Embiid matchup where you know you can point to various teams and say well maybe Brooke Lopez can't play as much well in a matchup with Philadelphia he's going to play a lot so sure that is a good point the 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 reliance on a backup center it becomes even more minimal there yeah and I would say this and you know it hasn't always been perfect but if you look at the numbers whether it's a three-point shooting and the Bucs have done a pretty decent job at, at turning Embiid into a jump shooter. And, hey, look, there's been times where he's knocked them all down and destroyed the Bucs. That's going to happen. But I think preferably if he's doing that and, and wanting to launch those threes rather than trying to physically challenge these guys and get them in foul trouble, you probably feel a little bit better as a Bucs fan there. But anyway, I'm sure the Bucs and the Sixers playoff series will talk about it more, this mythical thing that uh, hasn't quite come uh, to fruition so far. But we'll see if it does. But let us know. How are you feeling about the MVP debate? And look, let's face it. I think that our comments are going to be one-sided towards our man, Giannis, and we absolutely love that. But we wanted to do this a little bit respectfully because, look, we are the same, Justin. It's not like we planned this, but we are the same. I'm not looking to crap on any of the other two guys. I think it's Giannis. I don't really like the way the debate has gone this year. It's kind of a little bit nasty towards yeah. the other guys, which is is not really the way we want to see it. But let us know. Uh, what you think either way and make your case for Giannis if that's what you want to do uh, as well there and let us know uh, what your thoughts are between the Utah Jazz game and the Denver Nuggets game as well because it's going to be a pretty fun weekend uh, of basketball I would have to say yeah and uh, again if I had a vote I would vote for Giannis it is not biased approach I mean just everything that you outlined with the statistics and the Bucks record when he plays so he would get my vote I think he is the guy that should be the MVP, my prediction is he won't win it. And it's going to be Joel Embiid. So that's what I mean by it. And, you know, the weekend that you mentioned, two big games, um, this was an interesting trip because this is basically the the gist of the end of your road games this season. You got six Mm -hmm. games left on the road, but one is the regular season finale in Toronto. And the hope is that's kind of going to be like Cleveland last year where you don't Mm -hmm. need that game. So it's basically four of your final five road games, if you look at it that way, are coming up in this road trip. We went over the injury report, so that already makes it an interesting start to it when you looked at those two games as being potentially very daunting. You also got a lot of rest for Giannis with the 23-plus minutes that he played against the Spurs, so hopefully a chance to do that again and and keep this in hand against the Utah Jazz on uh, Friday night. But I I also point this out – because it's something I've talked about quite a bit with Dave off the air um, about the odds and the concern over these games against Boston and Philadelphia. Those are likely going to determine who gets the one seed. If the Bucs win both of those games, it's a done deal. If they split those games, it's probably still heavily in their favor. Really, the only way 
statistically for the Bucs to really give up that one seed is if they lose both of those games. When you look at all the numbers that are out there, if they win in Utah tomorrow or tonight, whenever you listen to this, and we just went through the injury report, they have an 84% chance of, of getting that one seed. And I mean, even if the Boston Celtics, who still statistically have the second best chance of getting the one seed, even if the Celtics win eight of their final nine games, which is essentially nine out of 10 with that win in Sacramento, they still only have a 58% chance of passing the Bucs for the one seed. If they go nine and one down the stretch, that's how important those three games in the loss column are and what the Bucs have done the last few weeks. Well, we like those odds, and that was some real Scott Steiner uh, percentage-based uh, uh, <laughs> stuff there with the, with the Bucks and the number one seed. And I think there's only a small section of our listeners that will know what I'm talking about, but it is some classic vision that cracks me up every single time. Uh, make sure you check out the Locked On Game to Game podcast wherever you get your podcasts on your Locked On NBA feed. News, stats, info, analysis from the local experts across the network will have you covered every day after a busy night of NBA action. So check out the Locked On Game to Game podcast on your Locked On NBA feed. Uh, that 84% chance sounds nice for the Bucs, uh, finishing in the number one seed, but there is a 100% chance that we'll be back for a post-game podcast after the game against Denver. So uh, enjoy both games, and we'll be able to break it all down on the weekend. Make sure you join us, subscribe, like, drop a comment, give us all your feedback, and we'll catch you guys after the game in Denver.